Hi, um, welcome. I'm so happy to see everybody here tonight because this is what, the initial event of what we would like to consider to be eventually a citizen journalistic project that we are developing here in Burlington and with CCTV, mainly because the media is so screwed up right now that citizens really need to take control of the media and do their own thing. And it's kind of a national movement. Our institute that's sponsoring that program and other programs is called Vermont Institute of Civic and International Involvement, which was the original name of a place that I hold dear in my heart, which was Burlington College. And we have Armin Medic here, who was also one of the students there. So she knows what I'm talking about. But we're pleased tonight to have as a guest, Helen Scott, who is a professor at UVM. She graduated from, with a BA from Essex University in England. She went on to get a PhD from Brown University. She is a very well-known activist, a citizen activist, who educates a lot about very important events, including tonight she's here to report on the case of South Africa versus Israel and the taking to the International Court of Justice, Israel. And Helen has become quite an expert on that case and we are delighted to have her talk about her talk about that case and elucidate it for our public in this country who doesn't probably know a thing about it. So I'm very happy that it will be recorded also by CCTV um, and that it will be broadcast on our YouTube channel. And this is another example of citizens actually telling important stories, elucidating events on our own YouTube channel. So it's a great pleasure tonight, and thank you for uh, coming to hear Helen talk about this very important case. Well, thank you, Sandy, and thank you to the Institute for inviting me, and thank you for being here to talk about this very important topic. And I, I do want to clarify, I'm not an expert in international law, uh, but I am an expert in international literature. And through that, I've had to learn a lot about different countries in the world. And um, in the process, I've learned a lot about imperialism and struggles against imperialism. So I want to begin by saying that it does feel like we're at a turning point for humanity right now. We're all watching in real time as Israel carries out the most brutal offensive on the Palestinian people that we could imagine. World public opinion overwhelmingly wants Israel to stop this attack. And Palestinian resistance has spread around the globe. But Israel and its powerful allies are using censorship, force, and slander to crush dissent. Now, at the end of last year, South Africa's application to the International Court of Justice broke through the prevailing denial and silence with a loud voice, charging Israel with genocide. The case leads us to connect the current moment with the history of apartheid in South Africa. 50 years ago, the apartheid regime in South Africa appeared to the world as a permanent and all-powerful system. But black South Africans, at the forefront of the global solidarity movement, were able to defeat the regime. And that was 30 years ago, and it was after a long and hard struggle. The Palestine Solidarity Movement today faces a long and hard struggle. As South, Af as South Africa argues, the desperate ferocity of Israel's attack reveals its desire to eliminate the entire Palestinian people. Israel is attempting to obliterate the people's culture, its stories, its narratives of self-determination and resistance. But the movement for Palestine liberation just keeps growing. Mm -hmm. So in this talk, I'm going to try and do three things. 
First, I'm going to give an account of South Africa's case against Israel in court. Second, I'll turn to South African apartheid and the movement that toppled it, drawing our parallels with Israel and Palestine today. And third, I'll point to the importance of literature and culture more broadly in, in liberation struggles then and now. So, to begin. Last December, after two months of Israel's assault on Gaza, South Africa submitted an application to the International Court of Justice charging Israel with genocide, arguing that Israel's behavior is, quote, in manifest violation of the 1948 Genocide Convention. Mm -hmm. The application, which was created by a team of lawyers and scholars with deep collective expertise in human rights and international law, is a dense and devastating 84 pages with 574 footnotes. The team does not simply assert the charge of genocide, rather they substantiate in harrowing detail the scale and nature of Israel's deeds. They draw on a dizzying array of reliable sources, including many eyewitness accounts from United Nations representatives. And they expose the dystopic horrors that Israel has tried to keep out of the public view through controlling media access, shutting down communications, and killing Palestinian journalists. It, it's really an impossible task to summarize this, the application because much of its weight comes from the deep, layered accumulation of detailed examples, but I'll try to give a sense. So first, they catalog Israel's military assault, which they call one of the heaviest conventional bombing campaigns in the history of modern warfare. They write, after quoting satellite analysis, quote, Gaza is now a different color from space. It's a different texture. And now this is after only the first two months. We are now month seven. They review countless fact-finding reports documenting Israel's ruthless and systematic killing and terrorizing of the population. And then they charge Israel with two distinct crimes. First, destroying Palestinian life in Gaza through the destruction of Gaza's universities, schools, courts, public buildings, public records, stores, libraries, churches, mosques, roads, infrastructure, utilities, and other facilities necessary to the sustained life of Palestinians in Gaza as a group, alongside the killing of entire family groups, erasing entire oral histories in Gaza, and the killing of prominent and distinguished members of society. And then second, imposing measures intended to prevent Palestinian births in Gaza through the reproductive violence inflicted on Palestinian women, newborn babies, infants, and children. Now, in addition to cataloging these present atrocities, the application provides the historical background that mainstream US news report completely omit. They contextualize, they contextualize Israel's current actions as, as just the latest installment in 75 years of violent dispossession, they write, 80% of Palestinians in Gaza are refugees and their descendants from towns and villages in what is now the state of Israel, mm -hmm. expelled or forced to flee during the mass displacement of over 750,000 Palestinians, or Nakba, during the establishment of the state of Israel. They then go on to document the iron control that Israel has exerted over Gaza since its supposed withdrawal in 2005. They document Israel's systematic destruction of agriculture, fishing, water sources, and commerce, and their restriction of food imports to a bare minimum. 
They show that this war on Gaza, which follows many disproportionate and one-sided military campaigns waged by Israel over the last two decades, was launched against a population that was already impoverished, food insecure, lacking basic civil infrastructure and human necessities, and unable to move freely. This forms the crucial backdrop for Israel's current moves towards extermination. Mm -hmm. They write, through its destruction of Gaza's archives and landmarks, it is obliterating Palestinian personal lives and private memories, histories and futures, through bombing and bulldozing graveyards, destroying family records and photographs, wiping out entire multi-generational families, and killing, maiming, and traumatizing a generation of children. South Africa makes the case that Israel's acts are, quote, genocidal in character because they are intended to bring about the destruction of a substantial part of the Palestinian national, racial, and ethnical group, that being the part of the Palestinian group in the Gaza Strip. The acts in question include killing Palestinians in Gaza, causing them serious bodily and mental harm, and inflicting on them conditions of life. The argument is not adequate, Helen, you, I am not able to understand you. Okay. I'm That's, sorry. I'm not the technical our, chief here. Our daughters <laughs> have the same problem. Okay. The application is overwhelmingly convincing. It is also affirmed by much of the world. Other states within the Genocide Convention who have described Israel's assault as genocide include Algeria, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Cuba, Iran, Turkey, and Venezuela. State representatives who have referred to Israel's actions as genocide. Bangladesh, Egypt, Honduras, Iraq, Jordan, Libya, Malaya, Namibia, Pakistan, Syria, and Tunisia. And outside the convention, they include Qatar and Mauritania. Several, nation, several nations have subsequently joined South Africa in their case to the ICJ, including Colombia, Nicaragua, Libya, Turkey, and most recently, Egypt. Their findings were also confirmed in the UN report Anatomy of a Genocide, published in late March, by which time the results were exponentially worse. Now, in one crucial sense, the petition has been successful. The court found the charge of genocide to be plausible and instructed Israel to take measures to prevent further damage, as South Africa requested. But shamefully, the court did not call for a ceasefire, yep. and neither was there any enforcement of remediation. And Israel continued along its genocidal path. The Biden administration proceeded to reward Israel with a further $26 billion in funding and an increased flow of heavy weaponry. Israel, as you'll probably recall, deflected attention with its false accusations against UNRWA, successfully convincing its major allies to cut off funding to the one agency that was capable of providing any relief to Palestinians facing famine. Now, all of this indicates the limitations of the ICJ and the United Nations, and the United Nations as vehicles for global justice despite countless legal findings against Israel all the way back to 1948, mm -hmm. Palestinians have never received any serious redress through the courts or global political bodies. International law is double-edged. It has systematic inadequacies, but it can also be marshaled in support of political movements. But in another way also, the ICJ case has been successful in giving credibility to other voices challenging Israel. The combination of Israel's atrocities and public opinion globally are clearly having an impact 
even on institutions that previously kept away from Israel. And the recent historic announcement from the International Criminal Court that the Chief Prosecutor is seeking arrest warrants for Netanyahu and his defense minister is the first time the ICC has challenged Israel. Mm -hmm. As the Financial Times wrote, this is a huge setback for Israel. And this is why Israel and the Biden administration are so furious mm -hmm. at the ICC. Now, I also have to say that the ICC is seeking arrest warrants for three Hamas leaders. Netanyahu and Biden keep repeating that this is a false equivalency. Well, they're right. Mm -hmm. But not for the reasons that they give. Yeah. <laughs> there is no equivalency because Israel is a military powerhouse committing genocide with the full support of the most powerful nation in the world. Hamas is a small resistance movement defending against elimination of a people. Mm -hmm. It would be like issuing an arrest for the Prime Minister under apartheid, P.W. Bota, in, in South Africa, and also Nelson Mandela, <laughs> as big head of the ANC. But nonetheless, it is indeed a setback for Israel when its top representatives face arrest if they travel. <laughs> and now Ireland, Norway, and Spain have all recognized Palestine with more to follow. So in this shifting climate, South Africa continues to push the International Court of Justice. They issued two further urgent appeals, one in March and one this month. And even though they have not succeeded in stemming genocide, their efforts are very significant for the global movement for Palestine, Palestinian liberation. South Africa lived through its own brutal apartheid regime. In 1948, same year as the Nakba, the National Party was elected in South Africa and swiftly implemented a powerful network of institutionalized racial separation and discrimination. Apartheid was a deliberate attempt to strip black South Africans of all rights and freedoms and intensified the existing colonial system that was of racist oppression, exploitation, and segregation. In the next five years, the government passed a number of laws under which all South Africans were to be classified according to race. Race determined where a person was born, educated, lived, and was buried. African education was vastly inferior to white education. Different racial groups were not allowed to marry, nor were they allowed to have sexual relations. Blacks were not allowed to live in the same area as whites. The past laws were strengthened, making it even more difficult for Africans to enter the so-called white cities. Blacks were not allowed to make use of the same public facilities as whites. Now, under apartheid, white South Africans enjoyed one of the highest standards of living in the world, while the black majority lived in abject poverty. Millions were forced, re forcibly removed from their land and corralled into impoverished so-called homelands, lacking basic means to live, a tiny fraction of the territory that was, in fact, their indigenous home. Police were given extraordinary powers, and blacks had no legal way to challenge white authority. Black South Africans were subject to indefinite detention without trials. Apartheid ruled every aspect of life and was designed to humiliate and demean, inflicting great and petty injustices and cruelties daily. The parallels between apartheid South Africa and Israel are unmistakable. <coughs> Palestinians are classified by their racialized identity, which determines where they live, where they are born, educated, and buried. Palestinian education is massively underfunded compared to that of Jewish Israelis. Even though there is no legal bar on interfaith marriage, Israel does not recognize non-religious marriage. So this, along with extreme segregation, means that intermarriage is very rare. Palestinians are not allowed to live in the same area as Jewish Israelis. 
ID cards, and a punitive web of other measures entirely restrict Palestinian mobility while Jewish Israelis can move freely. Jewish Israelis enjoy one of the highest standards of living in the world, while most Palestinians live in abject poverty. Palestinians have been displaced from their lands and forced to live in ever-shrinking and fragmented areas, a tiny fraction of historic Palestine. Israeli police and soldiers have extraordinary powers, and Palestinians have no way to challenge Israeli authority. Palestinians are subject to arrest and indefinite detention without charge. Apartheid rules every aspect of life and is designed to humiliate and demean, inflicting great and petty injustices and cruelties daily. As you probably know, global human rights organizations, including Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Betzalem, and many others, have declared Israel to be an apartheid state. Mm -hmm. And even though Zionists ardently contest the label today, the original architects of apartheid were much more forthright. The white South African Prime Minister, Hendrik Bevers, said in 1961, quote, Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state. Israel was, in fact, one of South Africa apartheid's biggest allies. The typical perspective of Israeli representatives in the late 1970s and early 1980s is captured by the former Israeli chief of the general staff, Rafael Aitam, who said this in a lecture at Tel Aviv University. Blacks in South Africa want to gain control over the white minority, just like Arabs here want to gain control over us. And we too, like the white minority in South Africa, must act to prevent them from taking us over. <laughs> South African apartheid was in fact the blueprint for Israel's apartheid regime, which adopted many of the same laws and practices. The uh, uh, historian, Israeli historian Alain Pape writes, in one way or another, all Palestinians, inside and outside Palestine, are still living under a variant of the South African apartheid system. Now, black South Africans have long understood this. After a visit to Palestine, civil rights leader Desmond Tutu, the first black archbishop of, South, of Cape Town, wrote, I have witnessed the systemic humiliation of Palestinian men, women, and children by members of the Israeli security forces. Their humiliation is familiar to all black South Africans who are corralled and harassed and insulted and assaulted by the security forces of the apartheid government. Shortly after Nelson Mandela was released from prison, he said, South Africa will never forget the support of the State of Israel to the, to the apartheid regime. Mm. It is not surprising then that South Africa has been at the forefront of the global mm. Palestine solidarity movement. The famous 2001 World Conference Against Racism in Durban called for an end to Israeli apartheid. Mm -hmm. And just last week, delegates from more than two dozen countries met in Johannesburg to launch a global campaign against Israeli apartheid. I'm going to read from their founding statement. We, inspired by, and many of us having been part of, the global anti-apartheid movement that helped end apartheid in South Africa and Namibia, now rise as the continuation of that movement to confront the settler colonialism and apartheid of Israel and its backers to ensure Israel and those complicit in its genocide are held accountable, to support the struggle for the liberation of the Palestinian people, for the restoration of their rights to freedom, dignity, self-determination, return, resistance, as guaranteed by international law. And the, de the delegates declared that they will be unrelenting in pressuring governments to, to sanction Israel. In the 1980s, remember, South African apartheid seemed permanent and all-powerful. It had the support of all the capitalist powers of the global north. 
And government leaders and the press scorned the idea that a global solidarity movement could change that. And yet a decade later, in April 1994, apartheid rule came to an end. Mm. The country held its first ever general elections, and the African National Congress leader Nelson Mandela formally denounced as a terrorist and imprisoned by the regime in the infamous Robben Island, won in a landslide victory to become the country's first black president. This victory did not come easily. <clears throat> But Africans persevered, from the peaceful resistance of the 1950s to the civil disobedience in the 1960s following the Sharpeville massacre, to the militant labor mobilization and strikes after 1973, to the Soweto student movement mm -hmm. and the solidarity campaign that spread across the world. When I was in, at university in England in the 1980s, I joined my fellow students on mass anti-apartheid demonstrations. We educated ourselves about the history of European colonialism. We read the poetry of Dennis Brutus and the novels of Loretta and, and Kobo. We watched plays by Atoll Fugard. And we took pride in never buying anything that was produced in South Africa. The global movement de-legitimized the apartheid regime. Mm. Now we do have to confront a grim reality. The end of apartheid led to formal legal equality in South Africa, which has an exceptionally progressive constitution. But actual equality remains elusive. South Africa was in fact named the most unequal country in the world in the 2022 World Bank report. The majority black population overwhelmingly face poverty and worsening conditions, while the white elite has increased its share of wealth since the end of apartheid. This is due to the legacy of decades of apartheid, in part, but also to the priorities of a succession of post-apartheid governments who have not delivered on the promise of equality and liberation. They have presided over the same capitalist system that supported apartheid, actively repressing workers when they pursue equality and justice. In the infamous Marikana massacre of 2012, the ANC government sent in police to break up a minor strike, mm -hmm. killing 34. Legal equality means very little without economic equality. Mm -hmm. But the struggle against South African apartheid is nonetheless a vital history for us today because it offers a model of how a colonized people and a global liberation movement can defeat a seemingly invincible colonial regime. I want to conclude with two points about the links between the two anti-apartheid movements. First is the centrality of labor. The decisive factor that brought down apartheid in South Africa was the organized black working class. Mm -hmm. International capitalism was deeply invested in the regime, including major corporations that will be familiar to you all, such as Shell, General Motors, Mercedes-Benz, General Electric, and more. When black workers organized mass strikes, they interrupted business as usual and threatened the profitability of those corporations. This was what forced the white minority ruling class to concede, particularly the great 1980s mining strikes mm -hmm. in, uh, in the mining and metal industry. The big capitalists realized that their system was in jeopardy, and they pressured the government to negotiate a political solution. Now, one of the reasons that Israeli apartheid has been so much harder to defeat, despite decades of steadfast resistance, is that Israel has effectively marginalized Palestinian workers and the economy, its economy, is no longer dependent on them. Mm. The Palestine General Federation of Trade Unions just issued a report of current conditions for workers. 
Almost half of the Palestinian workers in the Israeli labor market have been dismissed since October. Gaza workers have had their permits revoked and have had no income since October. Thousands have been arrested, detained, tortured, interrogated, and killed. The Palestine trade unions have issued urgent calls to the global labor movement to support their picket line, which means not participating in the transportation of weapons and technology to Israel, and to pressure their governments to stop funding Israel. Given the marginalization of, of Palestinian workers in Israel, this international mobilization of workers is essential. In the words of Rafif Ziaga, direct action by workers has the potential to slow down supply chains, including arms supply chains, that are crucial for Israel's economy. Given Israel's complete reliance on funding from the US, this is all the more important for the labor movement here. The unprecedented upturn in, in pro-Palestinian rank and file union activism, which can be seen in the Labor for Palestine National Network um, and many other initiatives, including the current UAW strike mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the University of California system, is, is cause for hope. And we should give those efforts all of our support. Finally, I want to emphasize the role of literature and culture more broadly. South Africa's petition to the ICJ highlights Israel's assault on Palestinian heritage. They write, along with its destruction of the physical monuments to the history and heritage of the Palestinians in Gaza, Israel has sought to destroy the very Palestinian people who form and create that heritage. Gaza's celebrated journalists its teachers, intellectuals, and public figures, its doctors and nurses, its filmmakers, writers, and singers, the directors and deans of its universities, the heads of its hospitals, its eminent scientists, linguists, playwrights, novelists, artists, and musicians. Israel has killed and is killing Palestinian storytellers and poets. This attack on storytellers and chroniclers is deliberate. Uh -huh. It is part of the scholasticide that has systematically destroyed universities, schools, libraries, theaters, and museums. Israel is trying to suppress knowledge itself, to stamp out all record of the Palestinian experience. Culture plays a crucial role in resisting these attempts at erasure. The apartheid regime, remember, incarcerated the poet Dennis Brutus on Robin Island, but the world read his poetry. <laughs> they locked up Nelson Mandela, but millions of people all over the world sang the song Free Nelson Mandela. In a poem from 1970, Dennis Brutus talks of art's potential. This is a quote from the poet. An immortality outlasting all our time and hacking out an image of the human flight that out endures all facets of half truth. He goes on. Oh, might I be so crouched, so poised, so hewed to claw some image of my fellow's woes, hacking the hardness of the ice clad rock, armed with such passion dedication, voice, that every cold stone would rear in wrath and batter down the prison's wall and wrench them from the island where they rot. The Palestinian poet and educator Rifat al saw the same power. He tells of his revelation as he watched Israel's attacks on Gaza in 2009. Telling stories was my way of resisting. And it was then that I decided that if I lived, I would dedicate much of my life to telling the stories of Palestine, empowering Palestinian narratives, and nurturing younger voices. He told his students, writing is a testimony, a memory that outlives any human experience. 
and an obligation to communicate with ourselves and the world. We live for a reason, to tell the tales of loss, of survival, and of hope. Israel murdered Anaria, and they feared his legacy so much that they murdered his eldest daughter and baby grandchild. But in doing so, they have only amplified his voice. Anaria inspired generations of students, and he left a powerful legacy in the collection, in the collection of Gaza Writes Back and many other works that are now read by millions across the globe. One of the tasks of the Solidarity Movement is to honor and continue this legacy, as the new school faculty did when they named their Gaza encampment for Rifat Alaria, or as the UVM students did as they passed around a copy of Muhammad al Kurd's collection, Rivka, in their encampment and read the poems out loud. The Berlin Festival withdrew a prestigious award to the Palestinian novelist Adania Shibley. But her novel, a minor detail, only increased its readership. <laughs> and teachers like me, all over the world, added it to our syllabi, along with Is Isabella Hamad and Mahmoud Dawish and Ghassan Kamafani. This is why we hold reading groups. This is why we invite Palestinian writers to speak, play Palestinian music at our rallies. Every time a Palestinian writer is cancelled, more people read their work. Poetry, novels, plays, art, music cannot stop genocide or topple apartheid on their own. But they hold the power to move and motivate people to resist. Mahmoud Dawish wrote of the tyrant's fear of song and the tyrant's fear of memory. Alongside documents such as South Africa's application to the ICJ, culture has a role to play in our unrelenting commitment to Palestinian liberation. Looking back to the toppling of the apartheid regime in South Africa, we can draw strength from the words of Ilan Pape, who says, it is dark before the dawn that Israeli settler colonialism is at an end. Thank you. Love that very powerful talk. I'm delighted that it has it has occurred and has been so I hope educational to all of our citizens, and all of our residents in our neighborhood and, and hopefully around the world. This will be broadcast also on YouTube um, and uh, it will be broadcast with, because of these wonderful cameramen here who are working with CCTV, community television, and it will be broadcast, I hope, everywhere, Ellen. So thank you so much for doing that. Helen wanted to have discussion, I believe, more than a community Q&A, is that correct? So anyway, does anybody have anything that they wish Helen to discuss or discuss themselves? Yeah, just to explain, um, I just spoke in for half an hour, and there are other people in the room. So hopefully, some of you can speak to each other, not just ask me questions. Can't understand anything. Yeah, I just can't understand anything. Eric, can't you do something to improve the audio? We'll do that. Does anybody have any thoughts, questions, what's going on in your minds? Anybody? I thought that was a very important um, announcement today that certain countries have now recognized the state of Palestine. I think it's the first, really. And the states that have done that today are Ireland, 
Norway, Belgium, and Spain. I believe that's it, right, Helen? As far as I know, it's in Norway. What? Spain, not Belgium. Not Belgium, not Belgium. Spain. Okay. Malta on the way? Belgium. Not Belgium. Not Belgium, I'm sorry. Norway and Ireland. Yeah, three. Spain, Norway, and Ireland. I was especially uh, interested that the Irish have taken this important step. Um, and I believe it's because of the history of Ireland itself. Right, yes. Grant? What? Oh, yeah. The British occupation has visited uh, all, the, all those places, South Africa, Palestine, and Ireland. So. Robin okay. has a question. Well, go ahead. Robin? Uh, yes, okay. Sorry, I could not hear your talk at all, Helen. I really wanted to, and hopefully some way or other I can hear it. But I am, so I don't know whether you dealt with the issue of implementation. Yeah. In other words, uh, this is all fine and good uh, to bring these uh, charges against Israel, but how do we implement them? So my question is, um, the United Nations is controlled by nations. The peace, the, the UN uh, peacekeeping forces are made up of individual states, as I understand it. In other words, maybe to the Congo, it's every it's a, a bunch of men from uh, from Burundi or who knows where. You know, they, that's how they do it. I've always thought that the United Nations or that there needs to be a peacekeeping force of people who want to make peace, you know, who would sign up and get paid, whether it's through the United Nations or some other way. And this would be the way to implement these uh, very important uh, resolutions of the past five weeks. So what, what's, what are your thoughts about that? Before I do this, can you say whether it works? Can you hear? The, the other mic is better. Yeah, this one. The one screen. Good. Just no, no. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's fine. You can stay on the. Can stay. Okay. Can you hear this? Can you hear me speak? Yeah, that's, that's better. I mean, what I said in the talk, and I'm so sorry that you couldn't hear it. Um, was that the, those big global institutions are very inadequate as it, uh, in terms of implementation, implementing any kind of social justice because they're tied to a system which is loaded, it's stacked against, um, obviously it's stacked in the favor of the powerful, the most powerful imperialist nations, Israel and the US. What can shift things, though, is mass movements. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I put all of my hope, not in kind of improving or tweaking the existing international organs, but rather in using legal findings like South Africa's case against, against, uh, against um, Israel um, to build our movements. And that's what brought down the apartheid. It wasn't the UN. It wasn't the UN. It wasn't any kind of international court. It was the mass movement. So I would always say the international legal instruments are things that we can use, but we can't expect them to provide liberation mm -hmm. for us. <clears throat> I, yeah, I would like to add to answer Robin. This is Wafi Power. Yeah. My name is Wafi. Yeah. The, the, the international forces, it's between two forces, two countries against each other, and there are line division that those what so-called UN forces, they come to stand. But when there is an upper time within a country, 
between two people are living on the same country, mm -hmm. on the same land, you don't bring international forces. Right. You go to the source of the problem. And I think Helen Scott described it very well that the problem is apartheid, is racism, is discrimination, is a prejudice, and it is within the Israeli law. So to get rid of that, there is no need for international forces. Mm -hmm. If we get rid of apartheid, peace can come. Right. Yeah. But we don't force peace by enforcing it by outside power. Mm -hmm. And us, the Palestinians, we reject any international forces to come to our land. Mm -hmm. Already, the last international forces came to our land are the British forces. Yep. And what did they do? They created the state of Israel. That's right. So now we don't want it. They are not welcome. So, uh, Lafitte, so what you're saying is that it's only a movement, a grassroots movement. In other words, uh, as I would say, from below, mm -hmm. rather than depending on international institutions or states or even the UN, which has fatal flaws anyway. So we must have a change from the movement of citizens and people who live everywhere, really, to counter this and to, like in South Africa, uh, initiate citizen initiatives to destroy apartheid. Is and it right? is, yes, and it is happening, and we see right. it in the United States, and we saw it as early as this month, all over the campuses of the United yep. States, that they do understand what's the problem in Palestine, Israel, mm -hmm. and they recognize the problem. It's apartheid, and they ask for divestment. Mm -hmm. right. And when this is didn't stop in the United States. It is all over the world. When there is more understanding why and what is the problem over there. It is not just occupation of one piece of land. It's occupation all over the land, from the river to the sea, exactly. where there is a racist laws have been created by the foreign occupiers, which is Israel. The state of the fact. The, yeah. Right. And created a state. You call it a state, but it is an army who has a state. And it is a military. And it is a powerful. And supported by the United States and the Western power. And they are trying to keep it as is. That's why you see the American ships and the European ships and the unconditional support militarily. So us as American or people of the world, we have to recognize this problem. And Hill Scott talked about it, which is, it is the heart of the problem. It is the laws where if you are a Jew and living on that land, you are, uh, 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 you have an upper hand of laws that support you, support your business, support, I mean, you are privileged, you're enjoying a Jewish state, as they call it, at the same time as democracy, which is an oxymoron to call a country, label it a religious a Jewish state, and to call it democracy, it means the non-Jews, they are not enjoying the same laws, you know? They are second class citizens, but in the condition of the Palestinians, they are fourth class citizens. Because that system is racist against the Sephardic Jews, the Ethiopian and uh, the Falasha Jews, mm -hmm. and the uh, others as the Israel laws others. What we need here in the United States to understand that such system has to be broken, right. you know? And you cannot break it without stopping supporting that system and that government. And it's not only Netanyahu as people, they trying to say. It is every Israeli government since 1948. They built that system. Yep. 
So when we oppose that system and we call it by its name, it's an apartheid, and we do the divestment and sanction against it, that system will collapse. Yeah. If the United States stops one day mm -hmm. aiding Israel, it's over. It's over. Mm -hmm. And us as Palestinians, Christians and Muslims and secular, we can live with the Jews like we are living here and living, we, we live with them forever. Mm -hmm. right. You know? So the reason is the United States is the main problem supporting that system and never stop. Well, that's, that's an interesting um, point of view, I think, because so much of, the, uh, of our movement has been directed, at least by the media, against Israel. But we, I believe, should our politics should be directed against our own government and stopping that aid to Israel. Oh, yes. and, and it seems to me that that is something that the movement has to adopt as a strategy. We must criticize our own government, stop our own government from aiding these systems. That was true even in the South Africa situation. It was, a, it, I remember citizens organizing against the U.S. Absolutely. And that's what, and frankly, that's what I think I would like to do. And this is what my government. And that this is what the student told us. Yes. They went after the administration of the college right. and asked them to divest. And, right. and for the people of the United States, they have to go after the American government yes. well, and right. tell them to stop. Yeah. The students just taught us a lesson just recently how to do it, mm -hmm. and we should follow their lead. Yeah. Okay, Ashley. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what he can tell. Thank you for that amazing talk. Um, I actually think the movement is doing this and has been doing it from day one. The demand has been a ceasefire, but it's also been, from the very beginning, stop the aid, stop yeah. the guns, stop the U.S. political support for the state of Israel and its genocidal war. And I think when, when I, I hear Elon Pape say this, and it sounds ridiculous but it's also really true israel's time is up yeah. like this used to be the third rail of american politics yeah. you couldn't talk about israel in even progressive anti-war movements but people will say it's not it's not connected you can't talk about that here you can't raise that now everybody talks about palestine everywhere yeah. palestine is now Young Jews who are now rejecting okay. Zionism hook, line, and sinker. And that's why it's so crazy to listen to the Biden administration denounce our movement as anti Semitic. This is one of the biggest Jewish movements in U.S. history, is for Palestine at the end of this war and for Palestinian liberation. So I think our movement has been targeting the U.S. government from day one, mm -hmm. and students escalated that with a vengeance. Because mm -hmm. what they were demanding was not just about BDS on the campus. They were talking about the whole government, and particularly the Biden administration. So that now Biden, he, he is going to lose this election because he's more committed but, to genocide but. in Palestine than he is committed to his own re-election because young people are not going to vote for him. Black people are not going to vote for him. People of color, Muslims, Palestinians, Arabs, in Michigan, which is the key battleground state, they're not going to vote for him. So I think there's a profound legitimacy crisis for the state of Israel, for the Biden administration, and for U.S. support for the state of Israel. And I, Wafiq always says, says this, but I think it's really true. Palestine is freeing itself and freeing all of us mm -hmm. from allegiance to Zionism and allegiance to U.S. imperialism and support for this barbaric regime that oversees apartheid in, in Palestine. And so I think the clock is ticking. Our biggest task right now is to advance the demands that the students made for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And locally, we've got to win 
apartheid-free communities in every organization, and we've got to pass ballot measures in every town and city this coming March 2025 so that we can set up a BDS campaign for the state of Vermont in all its corporations, all its government, to divest from the state of Israel. So the time is up. We've got to organize international law in the UN as a divestment or whatever, and that was the result of the students, but that, and that was one success. It's it on YouTube today, Amy Goodman has it, it's up, it took a couple of hours ago, I saw it. Yeah, right. I, I have the feeling that it's all falls on the shoulders of the students. Yeah. I don't see the American people, you know, it's like students, you can go do your encampments. Is it due to a system? A neurologic and philosophical, you know, uh, insistence on having a ladder when it comes to uh, 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 cultures, uh, uh, a color of skin. Mm. Yeah. Is it is it a, a mad American? What? Is it uh, something that is deeply entrenched? Yes. In the, you no, know? I I would disagree. Actually, you'd probably say yes. I disagree with that. I think awesome. that there, no, especially on this issue, I think there is an element of race involved. However, the real, what I think is that for many, many years, um, including in the city, there has been a huge, in the power elite, a huge pro Zionist yes. uh, elite mm -hmm. in this country. And that's again what this movement has faced. I, was, I really appreciated what Helen said about poets. Yeah. You know, like two months ago, three months ago, a Palestinian poet was booted off the campus at UVM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was going to come here and speak at event plan for a year. And that was it. Yeah. He was gone. And there has been that kind of censorship. So it's quite it's different than, I know that probably Eric, many of others of us think of America U.S. as a racist country. That's you know accurate to us, but I don't think it's only that that mm -hmm. has colored our feelings and our politics. Then uh, how can how come can we defeat a I mean I mean put yes. an end to governments that are going around the world? In hoping. this instance, in the, uh, is backing uh, an apartheid system. Yeah. Are, we, are all Americans going? change the system. I'm, going, I'm not sure that, you know, relying only on students and they can and, no, and sitting on, in our, in our, yeah, our I ask, again, I want to ask, Lafitte well, told me one day recently, we're winning this. It's not just because, the students have been crucial, and I commend them and congratulate them, but it is not just the students. For instance, Wafi, didn't you tell me that this uh, difference was because the parents of the students, for instance, are supporting this. Oh, and the Mandela came out. I know there were pressure around the world, yes. but is it the same? Yes. Well, I don't think so because you're talking about the embeddedness of Zionist sympathies historically in the United States government. That never happened with apartheid sympathies embedded in the U.S. government. I mean, but at least two different. Two well, I mean. To the, to the same extent. Clearly, the U.S. government supported South Africa, but institutionally, all the way through, in communities throughout this country, there wasn't a culture of apartheid in right. universities, sports teams, businesses, like there is with um, the Zionist element. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, which Wait a minute. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Wafi. I'm sorry. It's a little bit different. It's true that South African apartheid regime didn't have APAC or 
the Israeli lobby right. or the power. But APAC itself played the role for South Africa. The only difference, and the United States didn't follow up anti-apartheid until the whole war, right. Right. okay, uh -huh. revolting against yeah. apartheid. United States wake up later and harvested all, yeah. you know, by saying we're against apartheid. And the last thing, the black American population yes. and standing yeah. against yeah. apartheid tilted that. Yes. yes. And yes. Right. Yeah. For us, the Palestinians, we don't have yes. that leverage. But we have other leverage. There wasn't a student movement since Vietnam War, right. the civil rights movement. We have the civil rights, we, we have a student movement behind us. You know, we have a public uh, generational differences. The students are with us, their parents are learning from them and they are protecting them. Mm -hmm. a, a Jewish father in UVM uh, uh, campus told me, he stopped me, introduced himself, professor in UVM, and he said, I grow up Zionist. But my child in the camp taught me a lot recently. Yeah. And I, I'm learning. This is in UVM, just recently, oh, two weeks ago. And all across the country, this is happening. But the government is racist, too. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it's against us. And they are silent about genocide and refuse to call it by the name genocide. genocide. Why? Yes, because the Palestinians are not white. Frankly, we're not white. Nobody cares about non white when genocide happens. Happened in Africa, they were silent here. Happened in, in Bosnia, they were silent here. We know that. When it happened in Ukraine, less than 10% of what happened in Palestine, you know, there was the first week, there was sanctions, boycott, uh, freezing assets, uh, spending assets, you know, of the foreign government, and everything. Why? Ukraine happened to be white. Let's talk about it as is. And this is what the system built on, on here. Um, and why they are protecting Israel? Because they are white. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to yeah. say a couple of things in response to your question. I mean, clearly, I mean, the US is, is a thoroughly racist and politically backward society, mm -hmm. and it's behind mm -hmm. the best developments in the world. And when you, even when you just look at the list of countries that have signed on to the case against Israel in the court, they're all countries that were previously colonized. Yeah. They're all from the yeah. global south. Yeah. Um, that's an indication. The US is the belly of the beast. But the, the, the two, I think, most significant developments at the moment are, you know, one, the solidarity from Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and um, the abolition movement and indigenous rights. There is a convergence of you know, this sense of collective liberation, which is seeing the connection with Palestine. Mm -hmm. And that is broader than, than just students. Um, and then the second development, um, which I, I mentioned in, in my talk, is labor, yes. the American mm -hmm. labor movement, which has been horrible historically, you know, also infected with racism um, and Zionism. There is a shift. It's a seismic shift, and mm -hmm. the unions across the across the country have passed resolutions for ceasefires. They passed resolutions for divestment. They are supporting the student protest. Many students, remember, are themselves workers, yeah. and so we are seeing this convergence of students and workers on campus, faculty who are unionized making common cause with staff who are unionized. That is the future, um, and, and, and you know, as Ashley and Wafik both talked about, liberating Palestine liberates everybody. Well, it is certainly helping to reinvigorate the labor movement in this country. It, it is a two-way process. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, just one of the... Zoe. Yeah, let's go. Zoe, yeah. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. What's no worries. Uh, I'm Zoe. I, I just wanted to propose um, Many of you 
you in this room are probably already familiar, but the organization I work for, the American Friends Service Committee, is working to sort of build that, that movement, that opposition, yep. um, grassroots movement, to, uh, to get rid of this really apartheid and mm -hmm. colonialism occupation. And uh, so Wafiq has a clipboard on his lap, um, and if you are a registered voter in Burlington and you haven't signed it yet, uh, we have something called the Apartheid Free Communities <laughs> Network. Uh, <laughs> more around the room. <laughs> uh, and, and there's a pledge that any community, business, solidarity organization, congregation, um, interfaith group, uh, any, any group of people can sign and that pledge uh, declares that you're, that you're working against um, discrimination and bigotry of all sorts, that you want peace and justice for all, and that you're going to work actively to cut all ties to Israeli apartheid, to, to work on that sort of stigmatization that we're talking about. Um, and I think we have, well, we have more than 300, close to 350 communities world, uh, worldwide uh, that have already taken that pledge and um, some of whom are, are working together um, to, to share ideas and to amplify work and um, and it's it's really powerful and there's big uh, big things in the works for in, in, Ber in Vermont uh, mm -hmm. and so I encourage you if you haven't seen that to check check that work out you can find more at the, on the Vermont Just for Justice and Palestine website and also apartheid-free.org. Because I think that that's yeah that's that's part of what we're describing here today, and I don't want to let us leave the room without yeah. some way to, to exactly. take action. Of course, right. exactly. Yeah, I, I I I wanted to also respond to Eric because I thought you asked a key question, which is critical mass. Where's the power line to change this? Because we're in a big fight. Because mm -hmm. the the U.S. government and its connection to Israel and to apartheid and genocide that has been delegitimized big time all across the country. You look, seventy percent of Democratic Party voters want a ceasefire when Biden is committed to funneling arms. Mm -hmm. So he's at odds with the base of his own party, mm -hmm. and the Democratic Party doesn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. but like we just went to the Democratic Party state convention, and we said we'd like to set up a Palestine table inside and have a session to educate people on Palestine. They barred us from the door. They said you can't, you can't set up a table. You can't do an educational. So we did a picket outside, mm -hmm. and all these sheepish delegates came out and said, well, we kind of agree with you. And they said, you should come in. So we went in, and then, unfortunately, hotel security kicked us out. But we passed <laughs> out flyers to everybody, and most people were very receptive. And it was only a couple of wacky Zionists who were like, no, get out of here. I support the genocide, or whatever they said. So, but, so I think there's a shift in public opinion that we should celebrate. Yeah. But Opinion will not change this mm -hmm. because this is a deep commitment of the U.S. state to the Middle East because of its oil reserves. Mm -hmm. That's what drives U.S. policy. Mm -hmm. They're not committed to anything but controlling the spigot of that oil, and Israel is their cop in the region. So they need that relationship. So it's going to take a tremendous amount of social power. And that's what Helen said about the convergence. Sanctions against 
the state of Israel. That's why what's happening in California is significant. 48,000 workers are going on strike to shut down higher education in California. So then you're starting to see social power. Mm -hmm. What that has to go into is the much stronger unions in industry, in big companies, so that people begin to exercise the power where they most have it, and that's at work. Even in tech, there are Google workers that are organizing against Google, which we know through the tech industry is deeply invested in, in, in Israel. And so you've got Google workers organizing. So I think we're at the beginning of something, but it's a long fight to build that critical mass so that we can really challenge the nature of this government and its connection and its dedication to the Middle East and Israel. Okay, Ian, Ian. Ian, yeah. Yeah, um, so Alan introduced us to the case and dissected and then resynthesized the case brought by South Africa to the International Court of Justice mm -hmm. and in the, in the process brought in a whole range of related issues and frequently touched on the role of the United Nations. Now that the International Court of Justice is an, an agency of some kind of the United Nations, yet it seems to characterize the powerless, powerless, powerlessness of the United Nations because this, this ruling has more or less been ignored in the way that historically the International Court of Justice ruling against the apartheid wall between the West Bank and Israel. That was ruled illegal. Well, that was years ago and, and what has changed. Um, and, and we've just recently seen even a Security Council resolution um, for a ceasefire just being totally ignored by uh, um, almost uh, all, the, all those um, countries that have power over this situation. Um, Mike, I do have a question in the context of that. <laughs> conversation I think has really been dismissing the United Nations, but Helen touched on you know, this breaking news um, of the um, International Criminal Court, yeah, which yeah. seems to be an exception, and the other part of the evidence for that is the, the, the outcry from the powerful yes. nations, including Israel, against that um, move by the International Court. Within the context of the United Nations, do, is, can we be optimistic that this international criminal court um, move may have a greater influence than all of those other United Nations actions that we've seen? I mean, I, I don't think we can put any faith or hope in the court. No. Again, I think that it's useful only insofar as it gives strength and confidence to the movement. Um, and that's, uh, you're absolutely right. The United Nations has deemed Israel criminal repeatedly mm. over yeah. the decades, and it hasn't made any difference. Um, the, the UN really isn't, it's not on our side. It's not for no. liberation. Well, the General <laughs> Assembly is. The General <laughs> Assembly, but that's a kind of an important distinction, the General yeah. Sa Assembly made up of yeah. kind of equal nations, yes. but it's the Security Council yeah. that is hopelessly... Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's hopeless. the, the veto. <laughs> it yes, means exactly. that the U.S. can just veto anything. Today there was a, uh, in the, I mean, from Africa, I was talking to a journalist, and then I don't know if we can, uh, it's true or not, but they're saying that uh, Han, the prosecutor from the yeah. ICC, was told by a European yes. leader, yes. Oh, come on, this court is just for criminals, like uh, um, uh, Putin Look, Africans. and the Africans. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The security, I mean, the, the UN is the beacon of you know, whatever is going on in the planet, like wrong, because you, know, you cannot just rely on the general assembly just for a big feast, everybody comes and you know can say something <laughs> for just a few minutes and then go. He has to be dismantled. Yes. He has totally to be dismantled. Mm. And, and 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 yes, the, the Palestinians are are doing maybe 99% of the job. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. That one percent has to come from everywhere in the exactly. world. Exactly. Yeah. Because we we are very my, uh, my 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 parents, my friends in Africa are very hopeful. They say that things are changing. Yeah. What today? South Africa can go to the to, to, to right. It's interesting that you know it's. Uh, that's what we want. And then we want also that Americans, each American, understand that, that those <coughs> flags that are, you know, waving at the United Nations, most of them are phony flags, <laughs> you know, <laughs> countries that were created just yeah. by the same people that were exactly. flagged the United Nations. Yeah. Yeah. In, um, in, 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 in 1996, I was a young reporter invited by Minister Daoud, which is the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs in Israel. We got to Israel. I'm being served one side story. Mm. Mm -hmm. I run away, find my way into you know, uh, the other side, but I got like in trouble. Yeah. Because you know you yeah. have to. So uh, I mean, the students are doing much, but we need to. Push no, no, but I want to point out something that you told me, Eric, a couple years ago. It appears to me that the strength of the movement against Israel apartheid is in the world, yes. in the black and brown world. Mm -hmm. You told me once uh, that the black and brown world really, and I kind of knew it, but you being from Coke, you are, told me, that the black and brown world views the, that they are in a common struggle with yeah. the Palestinian people, yeah. and that they support, the, wait a minute, yeah. the Palestinian people. And that's true here too. Yeah. So like what we used to call the third world or the developing world is clearly been moved by the Palestinians. They are with us. So I would not say that it's just the students, although I commend the students no, for bringing it up here. Yeah. That's for sure. But you know that the Palestinians help, you know, uh, yes. the, uh, the movement in South yes. Africa. That's uh, why yes. there's yeah. a yeah. Yeah. strong yes. friendship between the yeah. two nations. But there's, well, what I'm pointing out is I believe, and Wafi can, Wafi can ascertain this, is that the world right now is really on the side of the Palestinians, and that's why the U that's why I think the United States and Israel are in real trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Real trouble. No, I, I don't. I'm, of course, yeah. but and we all know that. But that the world is moving, and it's, it's creating an international movement. Yeah. So none of us should give up hope. Yep. All of us should commend the students for making it happen here, but it is an international Absolutely movement. Right. Apparently, the Atlantic has some article today that says that all these protests have been ineffective. Where are they at? What a stupid, <laughs> what a ridiculous statement that is. When you see people like the, the young people in this room, and the whole movement here has been young people, thank, yeah. thank them yeah. incredibly. So, what if we were in the region? Can I? I mean, am I wrong by saying that the Arabs, the Arab nations and the brothers, you know, Palestine around, are they, you know, doing much? Because yes. I'm not seeing it. No, no. You just mentioned that all these flags, those 22 Arab flags, are post-colonial government. Yeah. Same families have been appointed by the British, by the French. Yeah and supported by the American yeah. expansionists, and they are under control. Yeah. And most of the military they buy from the West to suppress the people. Exactly. But 99% of the Arab, the Muslim people, are supporting yeah. to yeah. Palestine. Right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they, they look at the Palestinian National Liberation Movement as, as the heart of their movement. Yeah. Right. And they see Gaza liberating them yeah. from what they are living under. And when we say Gaza going to liberate not only the Palestinians, they're going to liberate the war. We mean it. Yeah. Starting with the Arab uh, war, the Muslim war, and the African. And African and uh, Palestinians, as uh, the uh, Afri uh, South African uh, foreign minister said it, they didn't, the Palestinians didn't call South African government on October 8th. Yeah. We go back yeah. long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. And
and Mandela mention it, Tito mention it, everybody because our soil uh, is one. I am, I personally, uh, the first time I meet, I met uh, South African uh, and African from different countries. In Beirut, it was 1976. Right. They used to come to Beirut to train. Yeah. Mm. The African liberation movement. Yeah, exactly. They had offices in Beirut because the PLO was in Beirut. Yeah. You know? And this is still going. It will never break. We are one. Another question, please. In, two, in, in, in 1996, I was in, uh, uh, in Israel. You know, during when uh, Isaac um, Rapin. Rap, uh, Rapin was killed, uh, how can we trace the that you know uh, 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 um, that movement, the durcissement, the hard, I mean, being the hard hardness right. of the uh, right. of the uh, 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 Israeli government, uh, mostly the the. the extreme right, right to that assassination. I mean, is there a... Is assassination to who? Oh, it is. To what? Well, it's known. Yeah. It's known. But if you think Rabin was 100% pro-peace, you are mistaken. Yeah. Right. yeah. You know? Labor Party or Likud Party, the right wing and left wing of Israeli government, yeah. they said it. Yeah. There is no Palestinian state they're mm -hmm. going to see, and there is no equality, and the system of apartheid supported by war. The settlements movement under Labour Party were more active than the Cold War Party. And all the settlements projects happened under the left side, the left wing of the Israeli government. Stealing the water was the Labour Party, mm -hmm. you know? Diverting the water, taking over uh, Palestinian the kibbutzes. The, the, the kibbutzes is leftist labor idea. You know, don't don't think there is the good Israeli government and bad Israeli government as some American government official mentioned it. Yeah. If we get with Netanyahu, everything will be fine. <laughs> as a matter of fact, the opposite exactly. Yeah. There is so many Netanyahu. Before Netanyahu uh, was uh, Sharon, 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 Sharon. Yeah. Uh, Shamir before that, yeah. Begin before yeah. that, yeah. and they all, they all against any creation of Palestinian independent states. One of the uh, solutions came after the movement of the students, and, and people, they not going to relate it, but I as Palestinian related. Because of the public opinion, it changed. That's why three Western European countries recognize Palestine. Exactly. Oh, you're right, right. Under the pressure of their people. Exactly. So the people changing and putting the pressure on their government, not only in the United States. Right. And you're going to see more of that happening because the people in Europe, okay, understand. When you see one million, one million and a half demonstrators in London, yeah. But London still say, no, we're not going to recognize Palestine. It doesn't mean the English people or the British people are against it. You know? Yeah. Right. And Ireland the first, Scotland hopefully second. Yeah, it's and good, good, good in Scotland. <laughs> one, one thing I wanted to add is we have a wonderful movement, and the establishment is responding with a stick, mainly. Yeah. Repression, McCarthyism, mm -hmm. brutal racism, mm -hmm. ripping up encampments, but they also know they're losing and so they have to give us a carrot. And this is where I want to raise something that we should be worried about mm -hmm. because the Biden administration in these three countries that just recognized the state of Palestine, they it's a good thing, the recognition of the state of Palestine, but it's also a carrot designed to demobilize us. Yeah, right. Because that Palestinian state is not a real state. Right. It controls nothing. 
right. at all. Israel yeah. controls everything. Right. Recognizing that state is recognizing a condition of apartheid. <clears throat> That's why the zone raised is so important, because apartheid is from the river to the sea. Mm -hmm. And we cannot mm -hmm. let our movement right. get squeezed back into a two-state solution, mm -hmm. because that ratifies mm -hmm. apartheid. It doesn't rip it up. Mm -hmm. And that's why what Zoe is yeah, right. pushing for is so important. We're for ending apartheid from the river to the sea so that there can be genuine equality and democracy yes. throughout the entire historic Palestine. And going back to a two-state solution will abandon well, that project. Right. So we should be very wary right. about yeah. the carrot they're dangling, and we should not take that. Right, carrot. but it's, it's an important victory that three Western countries have said that the state of Palestine should exist. Yeah. I no, think. No geography, no law. Right. Right. Just Palestine. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> any final thoughts? No, anyway, I am I am really thinking that this discussion has got to happen everywhere. So thank you all. It really, really is a very important discussion to at least begin. And of course, the students have done that a lot. And thank you. Uh, and young people have done a lot. And Wafik has done enormous. And Helen, you too. So thank you all. And thank you all for being here. Really, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you.